I would, I would just pick up on, um, on something that Mark Horowitz said yesterday, which um, I, I think is, is quite relevant. Um, you know, we're, we're now in an era where pretty much anything we can imagine we can build um, uh, in terms of uh, being, project, being able to project um, information technology. And, and that is changing uh, the game in many respects. Uh, it's certainly changing the way we think about products, and I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, but I think it's also changing uh, the way we do research and what kind of research we do and how we conduct um, that research. And that's really where uh, I want to direct my remarks this morning. In 2010, 74.5 quintillion transistors were shipped. I don't even know what that means, but that it, I assure you that's a lot of transistors. A better way, I think, to look at it is that was 10 billion transistors per person on Earth. So if you didn't get your 10 billion, uh, I suggest you, uh, uh, you consult your uh, significant other and ask them why they uh, weren't showering you with transistors throughout the, throughout the year. Um, but I think the really significant point here is that uh, the compound annual growth rate over the, over the decade is an astonishing 68%, uh, which means, uh, in fact, that, uh, that that rate of growth is accelerating. And you see that in the, in the shape of the curve. You know, this is a, this is a log scale. Uh, so uh, I think much as uh, Ray Kurzweil predicted in, the, in his book, The Singularity, uh, we are clearly seeing this uh, continued acceleration uh, in, the, in the pace of, uh, of technology. Uh, you know, Ray talks about the last 100 years uh, representing more progress than the previous 20,000, and the next 10 years um, you know, will uh, easily exceed the progress in the last 100 years. So uh, the demand for the consumption of uh, information technology uh, is, uh, is truly um, growing at a, at a fantastic rate. Um, somewhat in recognition of, of that fact, um, Intel, um, about 10 years ago, not quite 10 years ago, uh, created its, its first true research laboratory. Uh, I think that's significant in, in a number of ways, but uh, I don't think most people realize that it was a major shift for, uh, for Intel. Gordon Moore had, uh, had run Fairchild Semiconductor Research. Uh, Bob Noyce was the, was the CEO. Um, and they were both frustrated with their inability to move research um, ideas into the, into the factory. Uh, they had a very poor uh, record of, of doing that. And so, in 1968, when they formed Intel, they said, okay, we're not going to have research. Uh, we're, it's not that we aren't going to invent things or, or look at advanced technologies, but we're not going to call it research, and we're not going to put it uh, in its own little building and separate and, you know, and, call, it, and call it research. Uh, those of you who've uh, worked at Intel or work at Intel, interned at Intel, uh, or have any close relationship with the company know that um, Intel has this euphemism called technology development, uh, which is about as close to research as the company got for uh, you know, its first uh, 35 or, uh, or so years. But uh, it began to realize that, um, that the, the kinds of applications for uh, its semiconductor technology really demanded that it, um, it do uh, true research and, and look much further ahead than, than the, typical, um, the typical product team is, is able to do. Um, that's not taking anything away from the product teams. Uh, they, uh, you know, but they have a different mission. And they may you know, take a year on a large microprocessor project to consider alternatives, but um, they, they pretty much lock it down and, and go into implementation and don't come up for for air uh, for typically uh, about four years. Uh, so we formed uh, Intel Labs, I won't give you the, all the history of that, um, with the goal of delivering breakthrough technologies to fuel Intel's growth. And that mission uh, grows in importance every, um, every year. Um, we've really uh, made it a priority to do world-class research in the areas in which we, we work. 
we measure that in two fundamental ways. Uh, one of them, of course, is sort of the traditional academic measurements of it. Um, you know, what papers are appearing in what conferences and, and are we winning uh, a sufficient share of best paper prizes and, and those sorts of things. But we also measure it in terms of our impact on uh, the company's business, on the, on the products and services that we build. Um, we work in a number of areas, and it, it's almost impossible to enumerate, enumerate them. We would, we would be here for hours. Um, but I've grouped them into, into processing and programming. That's where you would assume we would, we would do a lot of work. Um, you might be surprised that we work in energy and sustainability. And I'm not just talking about energy efficiency, although we include energy efficiency in, in this area, but we're starting to look at how information technology can help us uh, conserve energy and reduce energy uh, consumption uh, at large. Um, <coughs> IT consumes about 2% of the world's energy. So even if we were to make all of the computers in the world consume no energy, uh, we'd, we'd only reduce uh, the amount of energy consumption by a very tiny amount. But it's increasingly clear if you apply IT to, um, to uh, other areas where energy is consumed, uh, it can indirectly uh, lead to dramatic reductions in energy consumption. Um, security and, and virtualization uh, have become uh, very, very important in the, in the last uh, five years, six years. We started about 10 years ago. Uh, in virtualization and really got, um, I think, engaged in security uh, about five, uh, five years ago. You've seen the results of our virtualization work in our, in our products and we continue to advance on that front, but um, you're going to see in the next couple of years um, some truly fundamental advances in, in security. Uh, and I put those together because some of the advances in security uh, <coughs> build on or can be seen as extensions to um, our virtualization uh, capability. Um, we don't do all of the research at Intel. There's actually a separate group. Well, there are probably uh, a number of small groups scattered around the com company, but the important one is something called components research, which is part of our technology and manufacturing uh, group. It's order of 100 uh, folks or so, and uh, these are the people who are out right now uh, working on sub-10 nanometer uh, process technologies. So um, the, the components research people sort of take care of process and, and device research and we start right at that point and, and go up the stack. So, uh, so we do circuits research. Much of that is conducted with uh, components research and other parts of the, of the technology and manufacturing group. And I'll give you what is easily my favorite example of that later in the talk. Um, and I think most interestingly, and I, I really haven't heard much mention of this in the, in the last day or so, um, is we do work in user experience and, uh, and interaction. We have a team called uh, IXR, which is Intera Interaction and Experience uh, Research. Uh, because uh, given this abundance of transistors and our ability to fashion just about anything we can imagine, it's increasingly clear that what, um, you know, what people want are products and services that make them happy, uh, that they can enjoy, uh, that they can, in fact, fall in love with. Um, and of course, when we say that to a group of, of hardware engineers, they go, didn't learn about love in college. Uh, you know, is there a love class at the Technion, you know, product love? Um, but you see it and you know it, uh, you know, clearly Apple products have distinguished themselves uh, on, that, on that basis. People really do love um, those, those products and, and Steve Jobs has a remarkable gift for, for dialing into that and, uh, and the product teams at Apple uh, do uh, an equally fantastic job realizing um, his, um, his visions. Turns out you can actually quantify it. Uh, you can turn it into an engineering discipline. I'll say a little bit more about that. So that's a, kind of a brief view. Um, these days, you can't really do world-class research unless you're, you're part of a larger team and you have strong uh, partnerships. And, and ours divide, um, I think, along both traditional and untraditional uh, lines. Um, clearly, uh, we place high value on our university partnerships. That's one of the reasons uh, we're here today. 
Uh, that's one of the reasons we've been, been part of research at the Technion for, uh, for many, many years, and of course with, with other uh, leading institutions um, around, the, around the world. Um, we, we recently uh, undertook uh, a transformation of our university research uh, relations with something called the Intel Science and Technology Centers, and I'll talk more about that uh, in a little bit. So uh, we're not stationary, we're not static here, we're always uh, sort of testing uh, these new ideas, and, and uh, just, as it, just as we would test a new technical idea, we, we test uh, new ideas um, uh, for working more effectively with um, the academic sector. Um, we actually do uh, a surprising amount of government research. Uh, we're not uh, what I think is considered uh, beltway bandits. That's a reference to um, the beltway around Washington, D.C., where there are countless companies that uh, just apply for, for government uh, funding. That's, that's the nature of their business. But when um, government research uh, objectives and intel research objectives uh, align, we're not uh, we're not reluctant to enter into such agreements. The most recent one is um, around ubiquitous high-performance computing. Uh, DARPA can't call it exascale because DOE has the exascale <coughs> charter, uh, but um, this is basically uh, technology for, for exascale. And the one that may be a little bit out of the, out of the norm uh, is our, our industry partnerships, and, and in this case, I'll highlight Thunderbolt. If you've got a new... Um, MacBook or an iMac, you have a Thunderbolt connector. I guess iMacs have two Thunderbolt connectors. This um, is probably the best example I can give of a technology that literally went straight from the lab to the product. Um, we, um, we, we showed this to Apple several years ago as something we were working on in the labs, and they went, we want that, and we want that as soon as possible. Uh, and they got it. Uh, and, uh, and I think they're, um, they're really excited about it, and you're going to see a lot more innovation at the platform level, the system level in Apple products as a result of, of Thunderbolt. Um, and finally, we, we spent uh, considerable time over the last five years um, trying to figure out how to transfer technology more efficiently. This gets, this gets back to the, the noise more dilemma in the late 60s, you know, how do we get these great ideas out of the lab and into the, and into the products? Pat Gelsinger uh, talked about, you know, that being the innovation uh, piece of it. I may have some quibble, quibbles with how Pat defines it, but um, be that as it may, um, we did not feel we were doing the job we could do uh, in terms of moving that, that technology into, into products, and we've, and we've really focused on it, and we've come up with some, some techniques that have dramatically uh, improved our ability to do that. I'm not going to talk about that part today, however. Um, so for the, for the next few minutes, I, I just thought it would be interesting, uh, or I hope you find it interesting, um, to explore uh, with me some of, the, some of Intel Labs' um, research areas. These are just a few selected topics. Uh, hopefully one or more of them uh, will, will interest you. But um, I was trying to give you uh, sort of the maximum sweep uh, across uh, across Intel uh, Intel Labs, so let me start with user experience. <clears throat> um, and and as I said a moment ago, this is about creating experiences that that people love. Um, and what we've done um, over the last decade uh, is is assemble at Intel uh, a team of social scientists, uh, social anthropologists, ethnographers. Uh, we even have a few uh, behavioral economists. Don't ask me to define what that is, but we have them. Uh, and apparently they're, they're doing good work because they're, they're highly valued. Um, and we, we, we've taken, taken a very disciplined approach to, um, to design and, and to understanding how people react to uh, the design of a, of a particular experience. Uh, and we've learned how to measure it, and we've learned how to take those measurements and iterate um, our designs and, and ultimately validate uh, those designs. And on more than one occasion, uh, that iterative process has resulted in, in dramatic <coughs> changes and, and hopefully improvements 
uh, in uh, the likability or lovability, if you prefer, of, uh, of, our, uh, of our products. And that process is, is interwoven with, uh, with the rest of the product design uh, process um, so that we're constantly testing and retesting uh, those ideas all the way uh, to the point we're ready to uh, release a product uh, to the market. Um, to um, put a little meat behind that, <laughs> um, I think this is a good question to ask. It's one, <laughs> it's one that we've asked at Intel. Um, do you really want a PC user interface on your TV? Um, and those of you who have experienced Windows Media Center, and I'm not taking Microsoft to task here, I think you know, they, they, weren't, they weren't trying to uh, uh, present this as some you know, next generation um, interface to, uh, to media. Um, but we actually tested it. Uh, we went out and, and we tried this uh, uh, around the world. And you find that, that what people like and what people don't like differs uh, geographically and culturally and so forth. Um, and one of, one of uh, the uh, popular anecdotes for the Media Center study was it actually brought people to tears, and not tears of joy, uh, because all they wanted to do was watch TV. And instead they found themselves you know, deep in the folder hierarchy, trying to do it with a TV remote control. It's hard enough to navigate it with a mouse. Imagine, imagine navigating the folder hierarchy with, uh, with a remote control, and they just couldn't get to the television program that they wanted to watch. And, um, so obviously, this was not a UI that people wanted to have on their television sets, and I think the response or lack of response uh, reflects, reflects that. The video ended on the, on the right. That's actually the UI that, um, that we developed as part of our, of our digital home group. Um, and as part of the, the total experience around um, that product family, our CE4000 uh, family. And I think all the folks who work on that project will tell you that right down to the silicon, right down to the CE4100, you know, 4200 uh, SOCs, um, user experience was a consistent thread. They knew exactly what kind of experience they wanted to deliver, and they were able to translate that into ultimately into, you know, into gates um, to, to deliver that experience. Um, and it turns out that that's, very, that's useful even if you, in the case, of, you know, even if we are not delivering the ultimate experience, maybe that's uh, a Google, as in the case of, of TV or a French telecom, um, you know, those folks are ultimately responsible for the, for the experience. But having driven the design from uh, the point of view of user experience, the design more likely incorporates those features that are necessary for delivering a good experience. Um, and Smart TV, uh, which we, we rolled out uh, last year and was the big news at the Consumer Electronics Show, is just one of three um, experience-driven designs. The next one being the Intel Health Guide. That's now part of, uh, that's probably my broker calling. Um, um, that is now part of the Intel GE Care Innovations joint uh, venture. That's one of the products that Intel contributed to the JV. Uh, but it had a team of social scientists, uh, ethnographers, and so forth um, that did deep, deep studies um, of uh, how uh, people wanted to or didn't want to interact with technology in their homes. The, the whole point of the health guide is to keep uh, chronically ill people in, uh, in their own home, their own apartment, uh, for as long as possible. Keep them out of managed care. And uh, it tends to be an elderly population, and it tends to be a population that is not always comfortable with technology. So a lot of deep thought into how to present uh, this health guide, uh, which, is, which is very interactive, in such a way that, that you know, people fell in love with it. Uh, and lastly, the classmate PC. Um, you know, a lot of people sort of think of this as, you know, this was Intel's uh, response to, reaction to one laptop per child. I think that does a disservice to the classmate design. This was also uh, the result of very deep studies uh, globally uh, into, into a computing platform that would be appropriate in sort of K through five, maybe K through eight uh, education 
Uh, and it's been, it's been a huge, huge success. Uh, and has now actually created a whole um, community of companies that build software for, uh, for classmate, educational software. So it's not just you know, put a bunch of uh, these cute looking laptops in, you know, in a classroom and hope for the best. Uh, we're actually able to measurably improve education as a result of that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the future um, of experience in terms of the impact of context-aware uh, computing. I talked about this at the Intel Developer Forum uh, last fall, um, and I really believe this is sort of the next step in, in UX and, um, and UI, where we bring context to bear uh, on uh, both the design of the platform, because the, the platform has to be context-aware, and on the applications that uh, that run uh, on it. And context awareness gives us the ability to answer uh, the questions that are shown here along with many other uh, questions and, uh, and take the experience and, and truly personalize it. Uh, Peter Fox, who uh, uh, is, uh, is one of the, the co-heads of, um, of our new uh, Science and Technology Center at the University of Washington told me some years ago, he said, you know, he pulled out his iPhone, he said, you know, I've had this thing for a year or two, whatever it was, and he says, it doesn't know any more about me than the day I bought it. And that's the problem, that um, instead of getting better and better, learning more and more about you every day and, and customizing that experience more and more to your, your specific uh, needs, uh, you know, we're kind of, we're sort of stuck in terms of, of where we can, uh, where we can go. So the next step is, is context awareness. To make a platform context aware, you have to give it sensory capabilities. And, you know, we've, we've seen um, more and more sensors coming in, certainly to the mobile platforms. But um, you actually want to use a whole range of, uh, of sensors. And, and let me give you a a good example of that. Um, we developed a, an experimental platform that, um, that you see illustrated here and uh, work with, with Photos, the big travel uh, company, to create a vacation assistant <clears throat> and uh, true to form, you know, following good user experience practice, you know, we built enough of them to have uh, a field trial in New York City and, you know, these are the real people, these are not actors or Intel shills or whatever. These are the real folks in, in New York City. Um, and they were able to uh, use the device um, as they moved about New York City on vacation. Um, and um, it might do, uh, it might know, <coughs> having asked you, um, that, uh, that you like live music. Uh, maybe you like, you know, live jazz. And, you know, you might be walking along, <coughs> but not know that a couple of blocks away is a great little jazz club and uh, you know, maybe it's got your favorite uh, jazz artist performing. And the vacation assistant would just come up and say, by the way, you know, so-and-so's in performance uh, you know, a couple of blocks from here. Would you like to go there? Go there. And maybe, uh, let's say you had show tickets later that day. It might say, by the way, you know, the performance is from four to, from four to six and you can still have a light dinner and, and be down um, on Broadway for, for your show at eight o'clock. Um, that's the kind of context-sensitive uh, application environment we, uh, we envision. Um, it utilizes both hard and soft sensors. These we're very familiar with, compasses and gyros and GPSs and so forth. But using the soft sensors like your, your calendar and your, um, your preferences and, and your interests um, really take it to the next level. I mean, your calendar probably says you've got an important meeting. Uh, by the way, there's traffic. This would have helped us this morning. Uh, there's traffic here between uh, um, the, the Dan Hotel and, uh, and the Technion. Here's the fastest, uh, here's the fastest route. Um, to do this, we had to create something we call the context, the Intel context engine. And this is now going to, um, to product. Uh, and it, uh, it knows how to talk to sensors. Um, it has a variety of inferencing. Uh, capabilities depending on the on the type of data because it's doing quite a bit of fusion here <clears throat> it can um, do analysis on that information uh, as well as statistical analysis and it includes a data store and the data store is particularly interesting 
Because if you think stealing a credit card is a big deal, imagine if somebody was stealing all of this context that you've built uh, over you know, months or, or even years. So a lot, of, a lot of security considerations go into this. Uh, and the ability to abstract it for applications. So uh, you know, the typical application actually can't get to the, to the raw information, but sees a, a more distilled one. OK. Um, so user experience, uh, user interface, and, and you know, if I can offer a bit of advice, uh, I think this may be uh, an opportunity, unless there's a sociology department, anthropology department at Technion. I haven't seen it yet, but maybe it's out there. Uh, but maybe for a collaboration with some of the, the other uh, institutions in the, in the country who are, um, you know, who are strong in that, uh, in that area. Uh, and, and I know our social scientists and, and ethnographers and so forth, um, they really enjoy um, the interaction with the people who can, who can bring their visions uh, to light. And so I think it's a very, it's a, a very powerful opportunity. Um, let me move to more traditional and familiar uh, subjects um, uh, and, you know, closer to uh, the sorts of sorts of stuff you think about Intel doing. Um, as I mentioned, we're doing lots of work in, in energy efficient design. One area that we're, we're particularly active in at the moment is something called near threshold voltage uh, operation. Uh, the graph here uh, explains the, why we're so interested. Uh, as, you, as you lower the voltage closer to the threshold, uh, you see the sharp rise in, uh, in energy uh, efficiency and, and roughly that's a that's an eightfold improvement in energy efficiency uh, versus operating uh, closer to um, to V max um, and so we're trying to understand how we design circuits that can operate reliably uh, down here uh, and if we can figure out how to do that this has the possibility of opening up opportunities for a whole new class of smart, very low power uh, devices. Um, we published this, I think, uh, I think this is two years old at, at Solid State Circuits. This is a, an AES encryptor uh, that was designed using near threshold voltage circuit uh, techniques built on 45 nanometer, uh, runs at 53 gigabits per second. That, as far as we know, is the uh, is the fastest such implementation. It's 5x better, uh, at least at the time of publication, than anything else. But it operates at 320 millivolts. Uh, and I think the threshold here is maybe just a, a hair below 300 millivolts. So we're really getting, getting close. Um, I can't show it to you yet, because it, it might preclude publication at a later date. Um, but we've actually <clears throat> just gotten silicon back on a complete IA compatible <coughs> processor. Uh, done in near threshold voltage. It doesn't realize the, that full 8x gain for various reasons, but it gets more than half of it. So we're doing pretty well, and we'll, we'll publish that work later in the, in the year or um, at solid state circuits next year. Um, kind of moving up the stack here, and I've sort of given you uh, uh, an Intel version of the, of the stack, uh, is our single chip cloud computer. I don't know, do you have, do you have one at the tech now? Yes, I get a yes over here, and I get a no over here. Yuri says no, Steve says yes. Okay, the answer is yes. Um, so um, this was an, uh, an experimental uh, processor design. When I, when I say it's an experimental design, that means it was designed in the labs. It's more than a billion transistors. Um, it, has, um, it has 48 IA compatible. Uh, cores uh, built in 45 nan nanometer. By the way, that's the current record. It will be broken soon. Uh, I won't tell you how, but it will be broken soon. Um, and what we really want to do is, is build this device, which, which we viewed as a forerunner to the kinds of processors that people would find in data centers um, in you know, 2013, 14, 15, uh, where we, we pack uh, a relatively large number of lower performance cores on a, uh, on a single uh, chip. And uh, we decided, once we had working silicon, that this would make a great experimental platform, not just at Intel, but across the, the research community. And 
Uh, I know there are at least 80 such institutions uh, around the world that have one or more of, uh, of these devices. By the way, we don't just send you the chip in a box. You actually get a, a system that, uh, that does all of it. It has, um, uh, it has a network on chip, two-dimensional mesh. Uh, each node in that mesh is a, is a dual um, IA um, core, uh, which is uh, more typical of what we see in cloud uh, data centers. They often have two socket uh, machines, so we put two cores at a, at, at a node. Um, because most of the communication here is message passing. Uh, it's based on message passing, whether low level or, or full TCP IP. Uh, we put in hardware acceleration uh, for that. Uh, for those of you who are keeping score at home, we do have an MPI implementation uh, that, uh, that runs on the SCC, and it uses the, it uses the accelerator and gets um, uh, terrific results. There is globally addressable uh, memory. It's not coherent, but the, but the, li the MPI library exploits that, that fact. Uh, and we use the chip to do uh, studies of fine grain power management. There's exquisite power control. Turn off any core, on and off any core, uh, turn off uh, different parts of the, of the network on chip and, and so forth. Um, I really like this quote from, uh, from Chris Rowan, uh, the president and CTO of Tensilica. I think it really sort of captures the design idiom here where cores have replaced transistors. Cores are the new transistors. Uh, and uh, I first heard Dave Patterson say that. I missed the attribution to Chris Rowan, but um, I think that, that that really captures, I think, the, the, this period of time where we're really dealing with uh, a much higher level of abstraction. Cores will just become these things that we pick and choose and, and assemble into larger systems, and, you know, and we won't spend nearly the kind of time focusing on what's going on inside, um, inside those cores. Um, moving way up the stack, um, something that, that we have a great deal of interest in because we think if we're ever gonna take high performance computing and get it out of sort of this narrow range of, of science and engineering application and make it an everyday occurrence where literally um, you have supercomputing power at your, at your fingertips, probably going to have something to do with the 3D uh, web. Uh, and so we've been spending a fair amount of time working with uh, the open source community on a project called OpenSIM. Um, we've been particularly focused on improving scalability and, uh, and performance. Uh, we basically want to be able to have a crowd of avatars, thousands, tens of thousands of avatars, uh, sharing a, a musical experience or uh, um, a sporting event or something like that in world. You can't do that today because the, at least the popular 3D web environments like Second Life don't scale well. So we're focused on that. And we also would like to improve the, the physics. You know, here we can come back to experience. When you see fire, it should be a, a high quality simulation of fire and rain and you know, the lighting and, and shading should all have a natural uh, appearance to it. Um, so as part of that effort, we've been um, been working on uh, techniques for highly accurate crowd simulation. I've got video. Yeah. Oh, I have to click again, so I'll just set it up. This is the, um, uh, the street view outside Shibuya Station in, in Tokyo. I have to look at this again. The simulation is on the left, and the, the actual video is on the right. Well, I'll let you see it, and you can judge the, the quality. Of that. This is based on mathematics uh, that we uncovered from the 1940s uh, and put to work for uh, developing this, this crowd simulation. And I hope you're st struck as I was that, um, uh, that the simulation looks so good. Uh, you know, people don't run into each other, they find clear paths and, and That's all why that. It's <laughs> I didn't hear the comment. Won't work in Israel. Won't work in Israel. <laughs> we'll have to put a, we'll put a we'll put a procedural model in, you know, for the Israelis. Right? Okay. Um, so let me just uh, hustle along. Her Uri's giving me the, the five minute sign. Um, of all the material in this presentation, this is my favorite one. <laughs> um, 
you know, to me, this, you know, this represents um, uh, all the best aspects of research, and yes, I will, I will go so far as to call it uh, innovation. This is a, the first complete, at least completed Intel, all digital Wi-Fi radio. Um, we realized some years ago that Intel didn't have it in its DNA to have a good analog process running in its fabs. So the radio guy said, okay, enough with the analog. Obviously, what we're gonna have to figure out is how to build really good radios using the digital technology, which is what comes out of those plants. So uh, over the years, we systematically went through, and I'm talking RF now, I'm not talking baseband, obviously, you know, you do baseband, well, maybe not baseband for Wi-Fi, but baseband for most things on, you know, on just an ordinary processor. Um, but we, um, we built power amplifiers, these are all digital switching power amplifiers, these are where the work was, was reported. Uh, our transmit receive switch, you know, in 32 nanometer, I guess I didn't say that, 32 nanometer CMOS. Uh, our LNAs, just fantastic low noise amplifiers, Sigma Delta analog to digital uh, converters, uh, a fantastic um, digital uh, synthesizer, fractional end synthesizer. Uh, here's our local oscillator source. Uh, and sort of the latest development, uh, which you'll see, I guess, just reported momentarily, is the digital modulator for that power, uh, that digital <coughs> power amplifier. When you modulate a switching amplifier, it takes a very clever uh, architecture to, to do that, just sort of doing pulse width modulation. Uh, so there it is. Uh, if you're a student, this is not the actual die, this is the die plot, uh, but uh, we'll have real silicon soon enough for this. So this is systematically going through every part of the radio uh, and inventing um, all digital circuits to replace that function. And in almost every case, and I'll give you one example here, the digital replacement outperforms the, the analog version. It, this is just the power amplifier, uh, and I know I'm, I'm dragging this out already, but uh, it's pretty interesting. So there's, there's the digital PA. Uh, now, not only does it still <coughs> beat all the analog PAs and CMOS, it, built the, it beats the analog PAs uh, both in silicon germanium and in gallium arsenide. arsenide. So it's, it's just a fantastic um, power amplifier. Uh, and has the, 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 the increased efficiency, so when you're running your radio, uh, that your battery is going to last a, a heck of a lot uh, longer by virtue of that, that efficiency. Um, and we uh, have another experiment where we drop this RF unit into uh, an atom-based SOC, and for the first time have a radio fully integrated with uh, a microprocessor and, and surrounding uh, IOs. And you know, if we're going to get to that nirvana of you know, single chip solutions, which include communication with computation, it's going to be, I believe, using this kind of technology. Um, we work in silicon photonics. I won't spend a lot of time. We reported uh, this last year an experimental 50 gigabit per second length. There are four silicon hybrid lasers. Uh, on this chip along with modulator and a passive um, multiplexer. So we bring the four colors uh, down to a single beam. That's a single piece of fiber microconnector. That's the receiver, which has the detectors. Uh, deep demultiplexer and detectors, it's all built in silicon. There's no uh, you know, exotic, no niobium titanate or any of the bizarre stuff uh, that have been used uh, historically. Um, and what we're doing right now is we're building a single chip transceiver. So here are the receivers discrete, but uh, we have that design. Where do you think this chip is built? Well, not quite, but it is built in Israel. In fact, all of our experimental silicon photonics has been done um, in Israel. Okay, um, and here's one just to titillate you a bit. Uh, we have a small team, a quarter of a dozen or so people, uh, who have this vision, have this dream of building a single chip DNA sequencer. Um, the analogy I like to use is this is like old paper tape readers, which only Uri and I have probably experienced <laughs> in our lifetimes. You're all too young to have 
paper tape experience, but um, this essentially uses, uh, thank you, uses um, electrostatic forces to, to pull the, the DNA strand over the reed head, which is a specially designed transistor structure, a special uh, FET structure, and literally reads out the, the amino acid sequence as the, the DNA strand moves past that, uh, that device. Uh, we've just taped out a, a 1024 cell array, uh, sort of our, our first fully integrated uh, effort. We've been uh, building you know, individual test structures. But uh, with the dream, you know, it could be five years away, 10 years away, that uh, you can walk into your doctor's office and in a matter of minutes uh, have a, a, a small system report um, uh, your sequence and, and tell the doctor whether there have been uh, any significant changes uh, in your DNA. So just closing thoughts. Um, we are trying to drive new models. This is the Intel Science and Technology <coughs> Center vision that we have. We've announced one of these at Stanford. Um, I'll show it briefly. Um, we'll announce another one next week in, in security. Um, the model, I just want to highlight on the right, um, looks like, like this. Uh, there's a link between the labs and the, and the Hub University. Uh, two PIs sit at that nexus. One is an Intel PI and one is the academic university PI. There's a hub school and then a number of spoke uh, schools around that. So we want, this is a multi-institution um, um, center that's very important because we want to build uh, community. And this is really the, the sort of the, the key idea, if you will, is this notion of creating research communities around topics of interest to Intel, the agenda built by that, that, uh, that you know, two in a box structure, those co-PIs. Um, and you'll see, uh, let's see, two, you'll see three more probably announced uh, in the balance of the, of the uh, year. They run for a period of five years, three years, we do a review, if things are looking good, <clears throat> we fund the, the remaining two years. And Intel funds, it's not part of our university grant, uh, for researchers that are physically located um, at, the, at the hub school. I guess they could be at a spoke school. We chose it. This is the one we announced back in January at, uh, at Stanford. Uh, ties all these US schools. Right now, the program is US only. Uh, in this case, there are 30 faculty members and 50 graduate students, plus the Intel, uh, the Intel team. And we have high expectations uh, for that. Um, we talked about this yesterday with, with um, a number of the academic leaders here, um, but I think over the years we've, we've, we've come to understand what works and what, what doesn't. First and foremost is you have to have an agenda that's mutually challenging and, and, uh, and relevant. These things can't be just open-ended. Uh, you have to fund at a level that ensures deep uh, engagement, and so you know, we're putting serious money into this overall for those five years. This is a $100 million uh, program. Uh, the universities told us what's critical to them is having Intel people on campus. So we've, we've done that. Um, and, and really, this is all about creating a research community that goes beyond a, a single institution. You can ask any of the, the PIs. They'll just tell you about the excitement that the centers have, have generated. OK, thanks for being patient with me, Uri. Um, but uh, I'll just close. And this is really a message to, to all the, the students uh, in the room. Uh, you know, us, us old folks uh, have pretty much done what we're going to do. Well, I speak for myself. Uri has much more to, much more to do. But, um, but I, I think these are great words from, from Alan, Alan Kay. You know, don't, don't wait for somebody to tell you what the future is. Uh, invent the future. And I hope you all take that to heart and enjoy much success in your careers. Thanks very much.